Θα ξεκινώ καλωσορίζοντας εκ μέρους του εργαστηρίου μας την Σάρα Γκριν, η οποία είναι η σημερινή μας προστιπλημένη ομιλήτρια. Χαιρόμαστε πάρα πολύ και μας τιμά η παρουσία της. Και καλωσορίζουμε και όσους και όσες έχετε ήδη συνδεθεί. Ε, ξεκινώ μιλώντας τα ελληνικά, αλλά σε λίγο θα γυρίσω στα αγγλικά για να παρουσιάσω και κάποια πράγματα από το έργο της Σάρας και βεβαίω η διάλεξη ε, θα γίνει στα αγγλικά. Και ε, όπως κάνουμε άλλες φορές, ε, η συζήτηση μετά, για όποιον ή όποια αισθάνεται ότι, ε, καλύτερα, μπορεί να επιλέξει τα ελληνικά και τα αγγλικά. Η Σάρα έτσι καλλιώ ε, καταλαβαίνει και γνωρίζει, μιλάει, οπότε δεν υπάρχει θέμα και μπορούμε να δούμε να δίνουμε απαντήσει στη γλώσσα που επιλέγουν ή στα αγγλικά. Ωραία. Λοιπόν, Σάρα, um, thank you very much for being with us. Um, uh, this is the second lecture of the... Uh, fourth cycle of uh, the ethnography series and um, we're very happy to welcome everyone uh, uh, in the second uh, out of the nine lectures that we have scheduled for this year. Uh, I should probably remind us that uh, uh, the, uh, the, this year's uh, lecture series has the title uh, Borders and Boundaries Revisited anthropological perspectives and public engagement. Um, allow me just to say a few things about Sarah Green and then uh, the floor will be on her to uh, uh, give us her lecture. So Sarah Green is an anthropologist by training and a distinguished social and cultural anthropology professor in the Department of Social Research at the University of Helsinki uh, in Finland. Her extensive research interests encompass borders, space, place, location, gender, personhood, and environment with a geographical focus on Europe, the Mediterranean, the Balkans, Greece, and the UK. She holds an exceptional academic record with numerous publications, including books, chapters, in edited volumes, and articles in academic journals all of which have significantly contributed to the analysis of the above mentioned issues. Regarding her work on borders, um, there's too many things one could mention, but just allow me to highlight uh, her book uh, titled Notes from the Balkans, Locating Marginality and Ambiguity on the Greek-Albanian Border, which was originally published in English in 2005 by the Princeton University Press and in 2020, 2020 in Greek by the Isnafi publications in Ioannina. Uh, in this work, uh, Professor Green argues that the Greek uh, Albanian border is uh, a region is a site of marginality and ambiguity where various forms of modernization and power intersect. She explores the experiences and perspectives of individuals residing in this region, shedding light on the intricacies and contradictions of modernity and the profound influence of power dynamics on people's lives. Uh, this study challenges simplistic notions of marginality and offers a nuanced understanding of the border region as a site characterized by contestation and negotiation. In the recent years, Professor Green has overseeing uh, a research project titled Cross Locations. And in a series of, public, of recent publications, she unfolds the principles of cross locations as a conceptual, theoretical, and methodological framework. The cross locations approach uh, unravels spatial relationships and interactions among objects, individuals, activities, and ideas within a specific area and emphasizes the complexity and fluidity of diverse border locations, uh, recognizing geopolitical borders as just one facet of spatial organization, as she mentions in her articles. The framework acknowledges that different coexisting classificatory logics define places even within the same physical space. The cross locations approach focuses on understanding interconnections, resistance, dynamics, and investigating institutions, organizations, structures, and individuals in their effort to define and stabilize the notion of location. Uh, today's lecture by Professor Green derives from her research in the Cross Location Project. 
Sarah, once again, thank you very much. The floor is yours, over to you. Thank you um, for that very generous introduction. I hope um, after you've heard that uh, write up that you're not disappointed by this lecture. So uh, I'll just put on my um, PowerPoint. I hope you can all see that. Uh, and um, that's the title, Animal Cross-Locations, More Than Human Encounters with European Border Regimes. I'll try and explain it. Uh, almost... Uh, okay, back to English. So I'll start with, let's see if I'm not going to get this to go. I'll start with um, something I mentioned in the abstract. On March 23rd, 2021, a huge ship, uh, it's it's almost as long as the Empire State Building is high, called the Evergreen Container Ship. It got stuck in the Suez Canal, um, blocking all other ships for over a week. Uh, just to give you an idea of how big this ship is, that's a down there. Uh, down there, that's a a tractor, and that's just the the front of the ship. And uh, approximately 20 livestock ships got stuck behind the Evergreen. They were unable, they were in the Suez Canal and were unable to get through because this ship got stuck. About 200,000 animals were involved. Um, there's been an effort to estimate how many of those animals died as a result of that, but it was estimated somewhere between 800 and 1,200 animals per ship. Now this shipping that got stuck, these animals that got stuck, it covered one day. Once news of the sewage blockage came, ships carrying animals um, on other days found other routes or, or delayed their departure. So the connections and disconnections between different parts of the world is one part of this story. Uh, the way that board, different types of borders work and connect and disconnect things, uh, particularly involving some, what some people these days are calling more than human animals uh, is, is part of the story. Classification and how we classify the world and separate up out different parts of the world is another part of the story. And I'm just going to have a brief diversion here on borders and classification and telling you a non-story about a, a hedgehog. This is some um, a hedgehog, I don't hope you can see it. It's just in a in a flower pot. Actually it's in a flower pot in uh, a kibbutz near Eilat in southern Israel. It's called Para Echinus Ethiopicus. That's the name of that particular hedgehog. It's a desert hedgehog. And uh, that one is Europeus. And that one's Ethiopicus. So these two hedgehogs, slightly different, but related according to um, the Linnaean taxonomic system. The Linnaean taxonomic system locates these animals. Uh, it, particularly through not only Latin names of various types um, that are given to them by ex mostly explorers who traveled around the world in the 19th century giving names to things according to the Linnaean taxonomic system, but they also designate habitat uh, and, and places where these animals are found. So Ethiopicus, this one, who doesn't belong actually, not found in, in contemporary Ethiopia, the word Ethiopicus comes from old um, Latin classical texts, which 
in which Ethiopia was a name for the entirety of Africa. Uh, but this animal uh, was named by a German naturalist and uh, its, its regional habitat happened to cross the Israeli-Jordanian border. So there are two borders in that area, one the habitat of a hedgehog and the other the political border. So the point about that uh, is that both political and habitat borders are historically contingent. They coexist in parallel in the same space. Uh, sometimes these kinds of different borders can cause conflicts. And an example of that is invasive species, and I'll get back to that later. Uh, the concept of invasive species is basically an animal and or a plant that is in some part of the world where it is deemed to cause a problem and where it should not be according to our classification systems. It's, a, um, it's about as bad a migrant, a legal migrant as you can get actually in, in human classification terms. So I'll be discussing how non-human animals, livestock, wild animals and microbes, which is a living living creature as well, become part of human border regimes. And that's a reference to, I, I've actually written a whole, a whole chapter about this particular hedgehog, um, a bit of fun. Okay. The main point is that not everything is controlled by political border regimes in the same way, if you see what I mean. Okay, so um, Yanis mentioned cross-locations and this idea, and so I'm going to briefly take you through what uh, the cross-locations approach is and what it means uh, before getting back to, to the animal story. All right. Now, cross-locations concerns the idea that the world is made up of overlapping layered border systems. Uh, so each layer is defined by different logics, which I'm calling locating regimes. So these layered border systems, they're called systems because they, they have a logic behind them, how the border regime is set out. Uh, the logic of law, creates border regimes of one particular kind. The logic of finance creates border regimes of a different kind. And they, they partly align and overlap, but they're not exactly the same. And the logic behind them is different. Uh, and disconnections are as important as connections. In a lot of um, social theory, say actor network theory, Deleuzean rhizome theory, those kinds of theories, the connections are the things that are focused upon. Uh, in cross locations, the, the disconnections are as important as the connections. The way in which borders separate things and create hierarchies is as important as the way in which borders might connect different things around the planet. And the, the disconnections is usually you can see is where you can see power operating. And the disconnections, so this is a, a map of the EU of different types of border regimes the EU uses. Um, Council of Europe, the European Economic Area, the Schengen Area, and so on. EU Customs Union, um, the Eurozone. Those, those kinds of border regimes are very much um, overlapping, this is why I like this diagram. So usually you think of borders as separating things out, but you do get border regimes that overlap. But the disconnections are as important. And so this you can see from that flag that this is an old map. And that disconnection was very significant indeed. Okay. So some examples from political mapping of this idea. This is a kind of traditional map of, of migration happening uh, across the this region and where it comes from and so on. You, you see these arrows that look very much like kind of arrows describing wars on maps. 
uh, and you get these kind of statements, sort of illegal immigrant routes into Europe and so on. So this is sort of taking for granted the political borders and showing uh, how migrants are crossing them illegally and where they're going to and where they're coming from and so on. An alternative, and this is by a colleague who worked with me on the Cross Locations Project called Philip Rakatowicz, an alternative is to show the kinds of borders that the um, migrants are experiencing. So this big brown border here, that one is in sub-Saharan Africa, and it's the result of uh, uh, agreements with North African countries about preventing borders, uh, preventing migrants from even getting to the Mediterranean. And then these are these black things are sort of Frontex um, patrolling. Uh, the red is deaths that have occurred along the Frontex frontiers. Then these little dots have have a variety of of uh, camps and so on. So, what what Philippe Rakajewicz is trying to do with this map is not show the the formal political borders, but to show the borders as experienced by the people trying to move into the European area and the kinds of stops and starts and connections and disconnections they experience. So that's one example of a cross location where there's one kind of border regime, which is the official political one. And there's another kind of border regime which affects people who are undocumented and trying to get from troubled places into some better places. Uh, this is another kind of border regime. These are the NATO flight zones in the Mediterranean region uh, that, that control where NATO uh, flies over. Uh, this is very important set of, you could call them border regimes, it's the submarine internet network around the planet controlling um, about 70 to 75 percent of internet connectivity. Probably you're hearing me through one of these cables right now. Uh, th these are cables that go along the seabed and uh, they connect the planet. They also disconnect the planet. Uh, they're owned by private companies. Uh, quite often, these these cables go much further than any country. So there's one cable called the East India Gateway that goes from, um, starts in the UK in the North Sea, goes right through the Mediterranean, ends up at Mumbai. It's run by 17 companies. Um, who who decide the pricing mechanism, they decide where they'll give access, where they won't give access. We've already seen the effects of that kind of private company control uh, in the conflict in Ukraine with the uh, Starlink um, access that's provided by Elon Musk, and sometimes he keeps threatening to take it away and so on. So uh, the, the these kinds of spatial connections and disconnections are not following uh, political border regimes um, exactly. <clears throat> okay, on to livestock then, and uh, how how this comes into it. the The point about livestock is is that controls of their being moved across the planet are that they're being controlled for different reasons. Uh, they're being uh, they're under the control of different laws, uh, different organizations um, manage the whole thing. And uh, often the crossing points are at different places. So it's a kind of a the movement of livestock across the planet is a it's a kind of a separate border regime from the one that involves humans moving across the planet. Um, and I'm just going to briefly tell you part of the research that I'm now going to be talking about in developing these ideas. Um, 
uh, as part of cross locations, which covered the whole of the Mediterranean area. I was doing things like studying the uh, the movements of camels, where they came from and where they end, how they ended up in a camel market in Cairo. I talked to veterinarians in Tunis and Beirut about how they um, understood the transportation of animals and the locating of animals and their movements and the laws about it. Um, I visited the Bedouin in the West Bank and the Negev Desert and talked to them about their experiences of increasingly restrictive border regimes that they were experiencing. I talked to a mortadella producer in Alexandria in Egypt about um, producing pig products in a Muslim country. Uh, I talked to a pig farmer in Calabria about uh, his experiences of of uh, the whole the whole business of of pig production. I've spoken to pastoralists and dairy farmers in Greece, particularly in. Epirus in northwestern Greece, where I, as Yanis pointed out, I've, I've done quite a lot of field work before. And, uh, and I've looked at the history of the livestock trade, which shows how the border regimes really changed over time, the border regimes involving livestock. Um, it's a very old business. Uh, there was brisk trade in exotic animals in Roman times, even. Um, some of that was even illegal. There was uh, domestic animals and there's increasing research on this, really fascinating research on uh, the way in which European farm animals were introduced to the colonial areas around the planet and how that massively changed the environments of many places that were colonized. Uh, the movement of animals and transportation of them has been going on for quite some time. Um, and of course, there were uninvited guests that have always come along with shipping and tr human transport around the planet. Um, and in the more modern period, there was a very big intensification of animal transport during the 20th century. Um, and as a result of that intensification, of course, inevitably, uh, diseases that are caught by animals uh, and the infections, they began to spread. Uh, and in 1920s, uh, the World Animal Health Organization, which was originally called the OIE, Organisation Internationale Épisodique, because it was, uh, and it still has its headquarters in Paris. It began as a way of trying to control the transportation of animals across the planet um, after a very bad outbreak of rinderpest. Uh, basically, uh, rinderpest. It was a it was a it was a consignment of cattle that started in India. It stopped in Antwerp. It ended up in Brazil and and caused a kind of global rinderpest epidemic. And as a result of that, the um, the World Organization for Animal Health was begun way before the it's it's the animal equivalent of the World Health Organization, the WHO. But it, uh, the WHO only started in 1948, so it's a much earlier organization. It's been around for longer. Uh, it sets the animal trade standards for, uh, for certificates um, it, for the World Trade Organization. It's a very powerful organization in that sense. It set up a system um, a few years ago called WAHIS. It's the World Animal Health Information System. People around the world uh, are obliged to report any illnesses, certain kinds of reportable in illnesses that they detect in livestock, with, sometimes within two hours of detecting them. Uh, so there's a, a huge surveillance system around the world that the, uh, the World Organization for Animal Health uh, assesses. It's staffed almost entirely by veterinarians. And the aim, 
there is to standardize and coordinate trade and health issues involving livestock. Um, and the whole point of that organization is to ensure that the trade can happen, but the disease is stopped. The key issue for controlling the movement of animals across borders has always been controlling disease. Uh, that that's, uh, you know, the, and the main motivation for that was the rise in trade from the 16th and 17th, 18th century, particularly onwards, and especially during the 20th century, huge rise in trade and then the increasing uh, industrialization of transportation systems meant an enormously increased um, circulation of animals around the planet. Uh, and therefore the possibility for the spread of disease. And that is still the focus of the, of the European Union's regulation on transporting animals across borders. You might think that the EU would focus on animal welfare, but actually that is not the main focus. Um, the main focus is this control of uh, disease. Now, Sometimes in the past, that was also the main motivation for attempting to control human migration. Uh, attempts to control human migration today are rather different, but on many occasions in the past, the main, the main concern, uh, for instance, in 19th, 20th century human migration to the US, and this is a, a picture from Ellis Island, um, was as much about bodies as it was about the social or ethnic background uh, of of the people. It was the it was the health that was a key thing, and there were always a set of doctors who were who were testing migrants on their way in. Alison Bashford, who's been looking at the the history of the relationship between health and borders, argued that it was only with the rise of nationalism that medical control over bodies became closely associated, associated with border management and control over territories. Uh, and, and so what it is that people are testing for, what it is that people are trying to control at the border has changed historically a great deal over time. Now today, human migration is much more about political, social and economic issues than about disease, which actually was also seen during the COVID-19 pandemic. That during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, most countries scrambled to respond to, to the spread of a, an airborne virus and, and how to manage that in terms of border controls, which are not at all designed for that purpose. Anyway, back to the animal story now. The live animal trade boom, 21st century, it's been huge. Despite all you might have heard about the rise of vegetarianism and so on, the global live animal export trade has quadrupled over the last 50 years. There's nearly 2 billion animals a year that are transported across borders every day at least 5 million creatures are in transit. And the majority are pigs and chickens, followed by sheep and cattle. Uh, less frequent, but also happens, uh, goats, horses, camels, and bees. And bees are an increasing thing that is transported because of um, the need for pollination, that the reduction in, in, in bee numbers uh, in many parts of the planet mean that People are hiring uh, beehives for pollination. And so they're being transported as well. Just a small intervention of um, part of the people I talk to in Beirut. Um, this is a this is an animal transporter. Uh, it's cap capable of carrying 20,000 cattle or 60,000 sheep and goats. Um, just the one ship. And I, I sp uh, in addition to speaking to veterinarians and others in Beirut, I also spoke to a cattle trader and he was one of the people that ran these kinds of ships. And 
he had been a cattle farmer. His whole family had been farming cattle for uh, many generations in Lebanon. But uh, he turned into a trader. And when I asked him why he made that switch, he said too many beef burgers. And what he meant by this was that uh, in, in the time when he was a young man and he was still farming cattle, uh, the cattle in Lebanon were much smaller animals. They're not these kind of huge Schwarzenegger cows that come from Brazil and Argentina, about 800 kilograms. These were, you know, much more like 200 kilogram animals. Um, people didn't eat much uh, burgers. In they they would they would buy other kinds of products, and uh, nowadays he said that an awful lot of towns and cities in Lebanon had these burger bars as part of modernization and the meat has to come from somewhere. And so the cattle trade increased massively. Um, and they, you know, there was this, as I mentioned, this transformation of breeds and processing of livestock over the last 30 years has been enormous. Uh, the, the breeds have, have really been bred to do all kinds of things um, in, to make them more profitable is basically the industrialization of animal farming. The change has also created um, transformations in wild animal distributions, and I'll get back to that a little bit later. Uh, but because the animals, the farming animals have changed, they used to, for instance, a lot of sheep and goats, and still in Greece uh, quite often, uh, the sheep and goats are out, uh, used to be out on the on the hills and in the pastures the whole time. An awful lot of animals now like that are kept indoors all day uh, and, and are fed, bought feed, which has meant that the, the hills and the pastures have uh, become available again for uh, certain kinds of wild animals, which has caused a number of problems. So that's changing the environment. In addition, in the current period, um, satellite and digital tracking of um, all kinds of transport. This is this is a uh, satellite image of of a particular moment in the Mediterranean of of the traffic going through it. It's now everywhere. So. The animals, whenever they are moved from one place to another, especially if they're in some kind of vehicle, are being tracked um, internationally. You can even look up these trackings on the internet at any particular time, see where particular ships are. Uh, and uh, that raises one issue of, of a particular kind of issue that the locating regimes in which farm animals are find themselves cause when they go wrong they cause huge huge problems so i'm going to briefly take you through the story of the tracking of the karim Allah and the el baik these are two ships they were animal transporters they began uh in in spain they were headed for turkey but something went wrong um and as a result of that going wrong, this is some uh, a mapping of the journey. They started on the 18th, one of these ships, the El Baik started on the 18th of December. It, it left Tarragona in Spain. It was headed um, for, for Derinje in Turkey. Uh, and this, the Karim Allah, uh, also left on the 18th of December from uh, Karategna in Spain and arrived in Iskenderun in Turkey. Uh, they were both turned down there. They were both rejected because the certificates that showed that they had come from a disease-free part of Spain were not in the right order. I mean, I could explain later, I don't really have time now to explain what was wrong with these certificates. Uh, but basically, it was a misunderstanding between what counts as a region and what counts as a zone. But as a result of that, 
the uh, animals were not allowed to disembark in Turkey. And then they had uh, a following three months going from port to port in different parts of the Mediterranean, trying to find somewhere to land the animals. And they were getting less and less healthy as this happened. And eventually they ended up back in Spain where the animals, because they had stopped off here in Tripoli and Libya, which is not a certified port, according to the World Organization for Animal Health, they had to, whatever their state was or their condition was when they got back to Spain, they had to be killed because um, they had now been in contact with an uncertified area. So the, the stakes are very, very high for animals in terms of the, the paperwork um, and, and how they're managed. Um, so, so this is one example of, of, of what happens when you get stuck in a, in a locating regime, in a border regime, if you're, if you're livestock, when it goes wrong. Okay, moving on now to wild animals uh, and zoonoses and invasive species. Um, this is probably the best known example, but there are many others. Uh, Wild animals and the habits of Chinese market traders were initially blamed for transgressive kind of bio mixing. The borders of wild animals and humans were mixed in an inappropriate way in this market. Uh, the, the Huanan seafood market in Wuhan had a wild animal section. It included live wolf pups, golden cicadas, scorpions, bamboo rats, squirrels, foxes, civets, hedgehogs. Actually, they were probably porcupines salamanders, turtles, and crocodiles. And uh, the, in the initial reporting, and there's still an open question of where COVID-19 came from, was that this was an inappropriate mixing of the wild and uh, livestock and that that caused the spread of COVID. Um, and then other people arguing Things like man's destruction of the habitat of many wild species may be partly responsible, that also that the inappropriate activities of humans in relation to wild areas might, might be causing the trouble as well. So all of this was about inappropriate crossing of, of, of transgression of types of borders. Then there was also the reverse zoonoses and the mink affair the kind of porous borders between wild, domesticated, and human. And this was about farmed mink during the COVID period. Um, and the Danish mink affair, uh, that what basically happened uh, was that the farmed mink caught COVID-19 from their human owners. Uh, and then 12 people in Denmark caught a new variant of COVID-19, which they got from the mink. That's a reverse zoonosis where, where the COVID circulated amongst the mink and, and humans got a different variant than had existed in the human population from the mink. So Denmark freaked out and decided to destroy all the mink. Uh, the World Health Organization congratulated Denmark for that. And I'm not going to go into the zombie mink affair. Maybe we can talk about that afterwards. And it wasn't only, they killed 15 million animals. Uh, so it wasn't only Denmark. 10,000 were, were um, culled from Dutch farms. Uh, Poland uh, started finding COVID-19 in mink. And it wasn't only farmed mink. Uh, the the they started detecting COVID in wild animals, a wild mink in, in the USA. And uh, right at this very moment, this is not over this kind of story, bird flu has been passed on to mink and that may transform into a flu that humans can catch. Uh, and so the question is open, should mink farming continue or should it be stopped altogether? A lot of animal rights activists have been arguing for this for a long time, but then now the question is, is this too much border crossing between animals and humans uh, that it's now becoming dangerous? And the, the question really 
concerns a rearrangement of the territorial boundaries between humans and mink. Okay, on to the wild boar affair. Uh, the wild boar are super adaptable and everywhere I went um, in the Mediterranean during my cross locations research, people were complaining about the rise in numbers of wild boar. Uh, they, they it, spontaneously, I never actually raised it, but people would say these boar are getting in the way. I, 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 they said that in Lebanon, they said that in Egypt, they said it in Greece, in Italy, uh, in Morocco. Uh, everywhere I went, these boars were causing a problem. And the issue seemed to be that there were many more than before. They were spreading into cities and farmlands rapidly. They were large, often aggressive, and highly destructive of human-created things such as crops, gardens, rubbish bins, etc. And uh, these are large, heavy things. You don't want to get in, on the wrong side of a wild boar. And so the news has been full of this. Uh, it's been happening in uh, Canada, Canada, in the US. Um, everybody now cares about boars crossing borders, especially the US-Canadian border. Uh, this is boars in Hong Kong borderlands causing trouble in cities. Um, this is in uh, northern Poland, uh, Polish wilderness city boars. Um, there's boar bombs, the scramble to defuse the feral swine bomb. Um, the explanation, what I, when I was going around the Mediterranean and asking people, what do you think has caused this huge rise in, in wild boar? But it's not only wild boars, there's certain other animals that are benefiting. They, they're usually small to medium-sized mammals that are benefiting from changes in livestock farming. Uh, but the explanation that people gave me for what's causing this uh, were a variety of different accounts, um, including in Epirus, the development of, of hunting tourism gone wrong. So the boars had been introduced in order to encourage tourism for hunting, but the hunters didn't come. And so the boars went wild. Some people in Calabria in southern Italy suggested that was that the boars had been introduced to reduce the value of the land so that developers could buy it up cheap. Uh, some people suggested, people who were pastoralists suggested that the removal of goats, sheep and wolves from um, the landscapes surrounding towns and cities had given the boar a lot of space to expand. Uh, somebody said there was a deliberate dumping of animals across borders. There was a veterinarian in, in Lebanon who suggested that, uh, that the Israelis were, were um, putting these animals to sleep with, a, with alpha chlorolose. So it was a very specific drug he suggested they were using. Uh, and they were driving the animals across to the Lebanese side and dumping them there. Um, and the whole, the boars were assumed by everybody I spoke to, the boars were assumed to be doing what boars do. Uh, they, they just go and do boar-like things. They snuffle around in the ground. They eat a lot. They breed. They do what they do. Most suggested that it was actually human intervention of some kind or human corruption of some kind that had caused the problem, that people I spoke to weren't blaming the boars. There, rather, it was thought to be the operations of power, of wealth, of hubris, of, you know, ideas and plans that humans had come up with that had gone terribly wrong. And the story in the end was about the overlapping locating regimes that people created. It was not about the boars. It was about how humans had created certain kinds of uh, conditions in the environment that the boars had then taken advantage of. 
which gets me on to the whole question of invasive species more widely. Um, there's there's been an awful lot of talk uh, in the in the media about invasive species. Scientists warn invasive pests are taking a staggering toll on society. The authors of a major new UN-backed report say invasive species are costing the world more than $423 billion a year. Don't know how they calculate that. Uh, that's from the Washington Post as an example. So some examples of these animals that are now being labeled invasive. Uh, these are actually peacocks in New Zealand, uh, geckos in Florida, foxes, in many different places, uh, cities, they're moving into cities in a big way. Uh, lionfish in the Mediterranean, um, even parakeets, places like Madrid, there's a shoot to kill policy on parakeets in Madrid now. So the language of, a, of invasion is something that I'm questioning here because it's borrowing from a different kind of border regime to to talk about what plants and animals are doing. So they're indeed doing damage quite often. And usually they're called invasive when they're doing some kind of harm to humans or to environments that humans care about. They are doing damage. But the language of invasion draws on this metaphor of war. It, the language of invasion or pest uh, uh, or parasite, these kinds of, uh, th th that kind of language is suggesting that it's these animals' fault, that they're doing it on purpose and they're invading in order to take over. That's their aim. Uh, so it's, that language tends to make people think that the animal is to blame for what's going on. And an alternative would be to focus on the cause, not the species. Uh, to look at what has caused these animals suddenly to move into the Mediterranean. Um, the lionfish, which is now um, becoming a bigger and bigger problem in the Mediterranean region, came through the Suez Canal. And the Suez Canal was human built. Before the Suez Canal, there was no way for the lionfish to actually physically get to the Mediterranean. Um, so, and the language, of course, of species invasion has a very dark history. Um, I'm realizing I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go through this quickly. Uh, this is a really, well, it's a, it's a very disturbing, but also very good study of um, the, the, the scientific study of the relationship between lice, typhus, and when you combine that, that was done during, he, Weindling is a specialist on Nazi science and what the Nazis did with the with science in order to support what was basically very racist views. Um, Nazi medics research on the danger of disease from the East, especially from Eastern European Jewish populations was used to, uh, to justify uh, really terrible things. So Weindling argues that Nazi ideology, racism, ultranationalism, and so on, led to the assumption that border crossing is automatically harmful because the people who were crossing were taken to be automatically harmful. And uh, so the invasion language was used to justify both scientific experiments and eradication. And the point that I'm making here is that both the idea of invasive species, that it's, it's transgressing a border, it's cr the animal is crossing a border that it shouldn't cross, uh, is always used as a good reason to destroy it, to attempt to destroy it, rather than look at what's causing the animal to move here, which is usually something that humans have done. Um, all forms of attempted control over the spread of disease, quarantine, fumigation, inspection, and examination of people, animals, and goods, as well as surveillance, have always involved spatial management. And those kinds of measures are attempts to impose a certain kind of order in the relations and separations between here and somewhere else. So the idea of, of trying to manage uh, how different spaces are classified and therefore keep things 
neatly on the one side or the other has been at the bottom of an awful lot of kind of spatial management of uh, sort of health borders, if you like. So moving finally on to issues to do with microbes, invisible living entities that spread across borders. Um, Cecil Hellman a long time ago coined the phrase germism. He noted that war metaphors were also used to think about germs as invasion and malevolent attack of the body. And uh, he said that this goes back a very long time for centuries. This idea of the invisible thing that can attack your body has been going on in, in Western cultures. And he said, hidden in the metaphors of germ infection, there is a fear of the penetration of that conceptual skin between the self and non-self, between them and us, that brings it with it the dread of chaos and moral contamination. So it's this fear of transgressing a border. Uh, and the contemporary period has actually made this worse, not better, with things like AIDS, radiation, superbugs, and now COVID. And uh, the idea of territories and disease, um, I don't have time, I don't think, to go through Keck and avian influenza. Uh, but an important point that these people made is that the borders that that are controlled for political reasons are often transgressed through through and justified in their transgression by saying, well, as, as Bashford put it, over and again, the aspiration to promote health and prevent disease has resulted in preemptive activity beyond the border. So you can justify breaking the rules, even of political borders, by saying, well, we're going to try and prevent this disease happening. Uh, I'm running out of time, so I won't talk about this. I may be in the discussion afterwards. I can talk about this. Uh, Frederick Keck, a specialist in avian influenza, has suggested uh, of that the way scientists work out how the, the location of diseases and where diseases begin and how they travel, particularly with bird flu, is a very different one from the policy makers and how they understand the whole thing. Um, and I'll, I'll skip that. Now, I've come to my conclusion. Uh, that's a wild mink, by the way. A focus on animal movements across borders highlights the coexistence and overlapping of multiple borders, the coexistence, so that different border regimes coexist and overlap with one another. Uh, and sometimes these kinds of locating regimes exist in parallel. Nobody really cared about that hedgehog that crossed between Israel and Jordan, came from Jordan, ended up in a flower pot in Israel. Nobody cared uh, uh, that, 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 that the habitat of that animal was crisscrossing the Jordanian-Israeli border. But sometimes these kinds of coexisting borders cause trouble, uh, usually more for non-human animals than the humans, as in the, the idea of invasive species. Um, the animal migrants, the ones crossing political, economic, environmental, urban and bodily borders, really reveal a lot about the contingency of human border dynamics. Thank you. That's it. Uh, thank you so much. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I think we should just uh, uh, open the floor for discussion. Uh, whoever wants, maybe raise your digital hand to comment or ask questions. So. Anyone to start? Helen. Yes, thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, uh, this very rich uh, presentation. Uh, I have one comment, and um, 
and the question. The first one is how much your uh, presentation reminded me uh, the work of a um, uh, page on uh, uh, the connection of racism with the environmental uh, problem and crisis, and all these traditions of taxonomies and hierarchies that uh, they, they, they were used to identify uh, geographical zones and uh, plantation and florence uh, fauna, and then they mitigate to humans. They are coming back in different uh, ways. Uh, and what, what I would like you to elaborate was that case um, uh, that you said about definition of zones and regions and how it provoked uh, uh, the problem in the journey of these uh, animals uh, in the Mediterranean uh, region. Sorry, I didn't catch the last, the, the, the key question. You said um, in the, I think the bike journey, that the problem with the paper was the difference uh, yeah. between region and zone, how they yeah. define it, yes. Yes, uh, yes, so, um, yeah, I think it's uh, first on the first point that you made, it's absolutely uh, not accidental that these these connections between the, the way animals are talked about and treated and the language used and and racist rhetoric from history. Um, uh, and the second thing about about the certification what happened was that the the OIE sets out or the the World Organization for Animal Health sets out um, rules that basically say that if a certain disease has appeared in a particular region within a certain amount of time, any animals from that region are not allowed to be transported because they might spread the disease. So uh, the, the certificate that these two ships had made a distinction between, um, there was a region called Tarragona, which had, um, which part of, part of which had a zone within it. And that zone had blue tongue disease, uh, but the region did not. And these animals came from a different zone but it was simply said the region was Tarragona. And as far as the Turkish authorities were concerned, these animals came from a region that contained blue tongue disease. So they were turned back. And, and it was a misunderstanding in the part of the, the Spanish authorities that they should have specified the zone from which the animals came. And that simple bureaucratic difference uh, meant that all these animals not only had three months of misery, but they died at the end of it. Okay. Any comments? Anyone? Okay, I, until somebody else appears, uh, for me, unless you want to. Okay, uh, I have uh, some questions. Um, Sarah, um, okay, I, I find the cross-location framework uh, a very, very beneficial, very useful way to think about certain issues. Uh, at the moment, I'm working on issues about borders uh, between Greece and North Macedonia, and um, uh, when I also read this particular paper about the hedgehog uh, uh, crossing, uh, immediately I, I thought to myself, uh, I, I remembered stories of uh, 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 older people, uh, uh, inhabitants, residents of the Florina region in North Greece, uh, you know, uh, narrating certain uh, similar stories about the cows they were using to uh, uh, cultivate their land, which uh, was on the other side of the border. And due to these uh, agreements uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, they could legally just cross the border and do the work in their fields and then come back. So uh, they were uh, talking to the uh, uh, cows and they were saying, uh, they're even talking either Greek or Macedonian 
and tell them go back, come here, don't go there, and everything. So uh, there's also, also for me uh, this intriguing aspect of uh, language use there. Anyway, and I thought that uh, this is a great uh, metaphor, which is not only a metaphor, of course, of how to, to see and talk about migration, refugee issues, and all that. This is a huge issue. I mean, I just mentioned this. I have a lot of uh, things that I could uh, uh, comment and talk, but uh, my question, just to uh, save us time, is uh, uh, relate uh, uh, around the concept of contingency. Um, I mean, I saw this image of the cut crossing uh, the border, as you said, it was uh, probably, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, a border crossing. Uh, and uh, uh, there are things that happen just, they just happen. But probably sometimes they create, uh, they produce action. Okay, so, uh, and then the other issue is this, uh, uh, comment you made about the existence in parallel of different regimes, okay, which just coexist or overlap. They, they're not in conflict or in any contact, uh, but they're there. Uh, so I'm wondering, how can we conceptualize these issues uh, with regard to the ethnographic writing? How do we write about this? What is our purpose uh, You know, when we conceptualize this and we want to talk about this? Thank you. Okay, big questions. Um, let's try that now about contingency. And um, the important thing about, I'm glad you raised it actually, because one of the things that um, is distinctive about the cross locations approach when compared say with uh, more Deleuzean approaches, for example, is that uh, under, under Deleuze, um, stuff is constantly happening randomly. Uh, so there's constant churn, differences constantly being created and so on and so forth. Uh, that may be the case, but mostly actually it's not random uh, in when humans are concerned. Mostly there is some quite powerful forces that are putting their hand on, on the scales and causing things to move in one direction rather than another. Uh, and so it's very important to keep an idea or an understanding of the power dynamics involved in that, because I don't think, I think that, you know, things are contingent in the sense that something else might happen next, uh, but they're not random. And so when I'm, when I'm um, saying that, I think that the point is that it's it's not possible to rely on the idea of a natural border. I think that's what I'm saying. And then the coexistence and how we might do that ethnographically. Um, I think that the point is to recognize, and there is there is a little bit of a a quite a, a radical implication in this, in terms of anthropology and its understanding of, of culture, uh, is to, is if you start thinking, well, everybody who is existing in a world that has overlapping scaffolded connections and disconnections with other places, and therefore, and they're perfectly capable of managing and and uh, articulating with that, uh, and and we all are. It means that there isn't, you know, what um, Eric Wolf famously called billiard balls, uh, that as culture that bounce off each other, that we're constantly borrowing and picking and choosing from little bits and pieces of different kinds of connections and disconnections with other things. So that it could be that an idea about, about public, public space, for example, uh, an, an idea that comes from uh, enlightenment philosophy or some contemporary political theorist in the United States might have huge significance in Beirut. 
um, because a bunch of people read read uh, Lefebvre and decided that they would campaign on behalf of public space using Lefebvre's ideas. At the same time, they're Lebanese people. And so, and they might understand public space that they grew up with in a very different way from Lefebvre. And those things can coexist. And so I think, you know, you can enrich your ethnography by not cutting off the possibility that there isn't only one thing going on in any particular location. Thank you. Um, may I, Yanni? Yeah, of course, of course. Oh, there is another question there. Uh, no, feel free to continue, and I have a look at the chat, and then we'll see. And also, I see hand by Pafsanias also. So let them give them the speech. All right, Pafsania, you go ahead then. I, I will uh, read the, the question on chat uh, in a while. So. Yes, um, thank you, Sarah. It was uh, really interesting, and uh, you know, uh, may I don't know. Thinking through animals is something kind of new, uh, and it's all. And because it's new, I think it's very productive. Uh, and uh, uh, I was thinking uh, first of all, um, I wanted you to elaborate a little bit if you want on the bo wild boar issue because I have come across uh, the issue in Greece in Peloponnese uh, in particular where also I have been told there is a bounty on their head uh, so you know it's uh, uh, you know people are going around shooting boars which is generally uh, I don't know seems dangerous, uh, <laughs> uh, but also I didn't know that it's a Mediterranean thing because what I've been told in Peloponnese is that, uh, again, a very common narrative in Greece, you have to do with uh, European Union's money that funded uh, uh, certain kinds of uh, pigs that they then went wild and breed with the wild boars and so on and so forth. Uh, so yeah, it's. I think it's really interesting to see why uh, and uh, what is the similarities and differences between the different regions in Mediterranean that uh, where the issue is. So yeah, yeah. Well, that's uh, great. Yet another um, theory of of what brings the boars there. Uh, and I think what I really like about these stories, which I get, you know, I've had everywhere, um, is that that none of them really blame the boars, even though quite often within uh, sort of policies of what to do about irritating, I mean, you can't even call boars invasive because they, they, are, they belong to this environment. They have always been there. Um, uh, the, the, the official thing to do with them is that they shouldn't be there they're 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 trespassing and therefore you have to kind of deal with them um and blaming the animals whereas these these theories are saying no something something probably corrupt that human powerful humans are doing is causing this to happen and um uh, but i i think uh i have to i have to admit a bias in that uh, I talked to some Sarakatsani in Epirus about what they thought was happening, and I think I bought their explanation more than anybody else's, uh, which was that two things were happening. One was that the in the past, uh, boars, if you put goats and boars in the same environment, the goats always won in the past, and uh, that the goats are now increasingly being kept indoors, and so the bulls are having freedom to go where they like. Uh, and and so and there are many fewer wolves, so they haven't got a predator around them. Um, but in addition, there's been a huge increase in domestic pig farming in Epirus, and those domestic pigs have been genetically bred to 
both produce much larger litters and also be larger animals and to have um, to have babies several times a year. And so some of these inevitably get out and they they mate with the wild boars and so they improve the wild boar stock as well, uh, which means that they become bigger animals that have larger litters and yeah. So I'm I think um I'm I, I like that Epirate answer best. But uh, I, as a as a as a um an ethnographic thing, what I'm particularly interested in is what people on the ground are actually saying about, you know, new new plants or new animals that are arriving on and what their explanation is. And, and very often it's got it, they're drawing these animals and their presence into human political border conflicts. Okay, Yang, can I? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, you put us uh, in another uh, scape, let's say, uh, of thinking. And uh, so I will start from uh, that Parsanias mentioned of thinking uh, through animals. For me, uh, it's very interesting, of course. And uh, I wonder if you want to elaborate a little bit on this. If uh, thinking through animals as you are doing, uh, following the trajectories, you just uh, gave us some examples and uh, some stories from the field, uh, that uh, can lead, uh, do you think, at, at um, the formulation of uh, or the discovering of new ontologies um, uh, on epistemological uh, um level let's say and uh, how do you see this um this modality to who lead to 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 other ontologies between humans and non humans uh, in the related post humanity and post humanism discussion in our days so it's a big issue but i would love to have your comment and elaboration on this thank you Yes, thank you very much for bringing that up. Actually, the ontological turn and the post-human were, uh, and and my slight difficulties with those with those ideas um, from an anthropological perspective was one of the reasons that I developed cross locations. So, um, I think the best of the ontological work that's been done in, at, you know, the Viveris de Castro's and the, 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 the Martin Holbrad, all these kinds of people. Um, uh, the best of that I see as actually epistemological, not ontological. Uh, that, um, yeah, that in, in, in terms of my very simple understanding of ontology is the study of that which is and epistemology as the study of that which can be known. And I think an awful lot of uh, the, the good work that's been done on ontologies is actually the study of that which can be known. It's about cosmologies, it's about belief systems, uh, it's about different ways of knowing uh, and understanding. Uh, and I think, I'm hoping that this particular approach can contribute to that more epistemological um, approach rather than an ontological one. Um, and in terms of the post-human, I'm very interested in the post-human um, discussions, but I don't, I'm not very sure as the, as an anthropologist, I'm very, I'm very, qualified to do very much about it because I'm an anthropos. I, I study people and so I don't I'm not a po I study how humans understand the world and and how they draw animals into it and how they draw places into it and how they draw borders into it uh, and and I could I could perhaps point out that a human 
centered perspective is not going to do much good for the animals that uh, are targeted. Um, but I'm unable really to say what the animal's perspective on it is. Um, and and that th that I can, the my skills are best served uh, by by looking at how humans have understood the animals and the plants and how they locate them and put them in in place. Uh, 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 which is not to say that I'm I'm I don't read and enjoy very much Donna Haraway's work and other people. Um, uh, but it it's it. I feel I feel the, the limits of my abilities um, are, are arrived at when I'm expected to look at the agency of the animals. I hope that answers. Oh, did I misunderstand the question? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Okay. Um, until I see any other hand. Um... It's uh, there's, it's basically a comment uh, in, in the chat where Nikos Stabulis, Stabulis uh, uh, mentions uh, pastoralists who moved their herds beyond with their herd beyond the current borders before the First World War in the Balkans, and he mentions this as a case uh, another case of erecting borders and how it affects livestock and humans. And I see another comment just now in far from the same. Uh, uh, participant in farming, if a tomato grows among cotton, it's considered as pests. Uh, yes. So the on the first point that was uh, uh, the the point from uh, Nicolas uh, Stambulis, that a actually points towards one of the first one of the things that if eventually led me to looking at animal borders because it was my research in Epirus, uh, uh on the Greek-Albanian border and that I did with a geophysicist. I was mapping where the um, pastoral routes were, the seasonal routes for taking goats and sheep um, summer and winter in that area. Uh, and it showed that very clearly that the routes crossed the Greek Albanian border. Um, people people pretended as if the border well they the border was not relevant for where you need to take animals uh, for for salt for food for getting away from pests <laughs> pests uh, getting away from you know mosquitoes in in the summer and so on uh, and for trade. And they, 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 those routes had been used for many, many decades, if not centuries. Uh, and the Greek, the imposition of the Greek Albanian border, definitely messed with that. And so I was, I was very interested in the fact that the, the kind of way in which people with animals understood the landscape and moving around it was very different from the political border regimes that existed in that area. So that's a that was a very nice comment there, um, and also you know if a farming if a tomato grows among cotton it would be considered as pests. Well, not exactly. It would it would be considered irritating, but it's not actually damaging the cotton. It's considered as a pest if it actually causes the cotton to be harmed. But it's a good point again that 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 word pest. Um, is obviously not looking at it from the perspective of the of the insect. It's looking at it from the perspective of the humans and the fact that that insect is getting in the way in some way of what humans wish to do. Uh, and and that uh, that whole way of 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 understanding the world um, uh, is now being studied not only by me but by a number of people of of trying to get at how our classification of the world of the natural world uh, is is based on what it's useful for. Um, Haj, uh, Gassan Haj wrote a book uh, about about um, 
is it's, I think he called it is racism an environmental threat and he in that book he talked a bit about uh, domestication the whole concept of domestication and he came up with this phrase generalized domestication which which basically means uh, the idea that humans assume that everything in the world is there for a reason and the best reason for things to be in the world is on for humans so uh and that the idea of domestication is is putting things to use uh and so and then the putting things to use basically means uh, making it serve whatever humans need it to do uh and and uh, that kind of idea also points to the way in which we just assume that the nature of the world is is there for us basically thank you Sarah. Sissy, yes please go ahead hey Sissy. i can't hear you microphone no, no, no. Yeah, Susara, I'm, I'm really very touched, actually, to listen to you after such a long time. Mm. So thank you so much. And I'm really very fascinated, I suppose, by the fact that uh, I can see how you end up here, kind of following the whole route and uh, the whole idea of location and how you ended up with the whole kind of idea about cross locations. And I'm kind of trying to follow from what uh, Fotini said before about how you see your work connecting or not being connected with uh, the post-humanism kind of debate and with the kind of cosmologies, Rivera de Castro literature and uh, et cetera. And I'm thinking all the kind of discussions we had about Ingold's work and how much it connects with history and political economy, okay? And I'm bringing up the whole uh, uh, Tim's work, obviously, because of his very valuable work about environment, animals, and things like that. Um, perhaps you could elaborate a bit more, because for, okay, let me kind of try to formulate my comment and question here. Uh, for me, your work about animals is another window, in a way, to understand how border regimes work, okay? And I really like the whole kind of uh, idea you put in the end that the, the, the board, the contingency of the borders of the political borders can be more or less better um, uh, seen, let's say, not better, can be seen differently if we start from a kind of animal okay, perspective. But you are not really uh, exploring in a way human-animal relations. You are exploring, exactly, yeah. So that's my understanding. That's why I cannot really see uh, from my understanding of your work at least, which is very political in the sense of using the, the kind of animal story to tell something about political borders, okay? Or borders in all sorts of ways, but not, well, symbolic borders as well. So I cannot really see how this kind of work can actually um, uh, be read in a kind of post-humanism um, framework or even in a kind of environmental uh, framework. Am I right, or perhaps? Yes, uh, yes, you are right. Um, and uh, the, uh, the I think the point I'm trying to make is, and what my focus is, is is how are people classifying mm. the world? How are people classifying animals and and their location? How are people classifying people and their location? And when when animals and people move. How are they then classifying that? Yeah. Uh, and and that's not only governments that are classifying, but also people that are classifying, churches that are classifying, uh, and and uh, other kinds of institutions. Mm -hmm. That and also and on top of that, there are actual infrastructural connections and disconnections physical connections and disconnections between different parts of the world that are f that have been put there following some classificatory logic about how you connect and disconnect different parts of the world. And so I'm trying to get that sort of three-dimensional Sudoku puzzle together to try and understand uh, how what the implications are of classifying in that way. I mean, the Linnaeus classification system it it wasn't inevitable that that would be the way we would classify animals and plants mm -hmm. 
uh, there was quite a lot of competition. And in particular, Goethe had an idea about how to classify animals and plants by saying, well, you know, animals and plants evolve, they, they change. They, you can't use a static classification system because these things develop differently. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. he invented a whole different classification system that lost, obviously, because we're with the Linnaean one. Um, that uh, and the Linnaean one suggests static types of, you know, genuses and families and taxa, subspecies and so on, uh, that carries a particular logic, uh, which which really affects how animals are located in the world and what humans can and can't do with them. So I think that that, that, is, that is at the core of, of what mm -hmm. I'm interested in, rather than trying to understand how it appears from an animal's point of view. Mm -hmm. And on Tim Ingold, I think the, the biggest difference um, there is that um, Ingold is very concerned with the idea of how one experiences the world. Ooh. and 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 how you move through it and and exper experience the three-dimensional world uh, from a very fairly strongly phenomenological perspective i i think from uh, and once you've figured that out you don't need to do any ethnography right you could once you've figured out what it feels like uh or or how you wayfind you don't need to do any ethnography I think in, in, in my approach, you always need to do ethnography because the way in which people create things in the world <clears> and <throat> ideas and thoughts in it um, will always change how things work out. And so you can, you can never assume to know what something feels like um, because part of what it feels like is also the, the political, social economic mm. historical condition but i mean obviously what is also very interesting and it's part of it's at the core of your work actually is not just the connections and disconnections but also the political economy behind that the hierarchies behind these classifications so it's quite interesting in a given moment or in a given context what kind of classification um takes uh, the is kind of is seen is read as superior and has power over the other classification and this is what makes this kind of work very political i think okay yeah yeah okay. Uh, yeah I, I agree and and it's also it's never entirely obvious which ideological or epistemological conception will will end up dominating in a in a particular context it's not necessarily the one that is uh, held by the power holders. Sometimes ideas can take hold. Well, I, and I guess Epirus is again an example where I was finding that people were understanding their location in Borgoni uh, in, a, in a way that was contrary to the dominant Hellenistic narrative. Mm -hmm. um, of, of what it means to be located in that place. And so, and again, going back to all that work in, in Epirus really did give me a lot of tools to think about these things. May I add Sarah, something? Thank you. <laughs> May I add a little bit on uh, Sisi's uh, comment and ans your answer, uh, Sarah. So I see uh, your answer that uh, your work is about classification and questioning the linear classification. Actually, this is uh, a, a way to challenge Western hegemonic epistemology, uh, of course. So you are not, uh, as you said, in the post-human uh, critique and discussion, but I see your work more bringing the ethnographic uh, work from, from, from the ground also and this knowledge from the ground, I see more your uh, that you are doing in the decolonial challenge. Let's say how to decolonize ourselves from the coloniality of Western epistemology, who is 
giving this kind of classifications and creates the political categories above these classifications. So I see. Yeah. I, yes, I mean, I would, I would agree. There are some implications, uh, decolonizing implications for for what I'm doing, and um, there wasn't really language for that kind of thing when I was doing my PhD. But um, one of the reasons that I didn't go to some remote or exotic part of the world to do my PhD, but instead I chose to take a short train ride from Cambridge to London to look at radical and revolutionary feminist separatists um, was uh, who were mostly had even higher academic qualifications at that time than I did and were middle class people was I felt uncomfortable with some of the things that were going was uh, the implications of how anthropology was being done and uh, so I think I've always cared a lot about the decolonizing effort in anthropology. And, and as a young anthropologist, I didn't know how to handle that except to avoid it. And uh, so just chose people who I knew was sure would yell back at me if I said anything they didn't like. Um, uh, and so... So I think you're you're right in my pursuit of um, what could be called, I suppose, as a Western hubris about what we what we can know, mm. uh, and and I think I would leave it to others who are much more experienced than me to deal with the material from the former colonies. Uh, uh, they they are much better than me at, at dealing with um, all of that. But I think we can chip away as a Europeanist. Um, we can we can chip away at at those kinds of epistemological uh, um, edifices mm -hmm. in a way that I think you know we learnt a lot from the postmodern poststructural moment. Uh, but it was extremely it was ext it was a little maybe a little bit too abstract and didn't quite pay enough attention to operations of power well, and uh so yeah okay yani f yes oh, what here i'm here i'm just waiting to see anyone else uh, wanting to pose a question. What do you mean? You want to comment on something? Okay. No, I think uh, if there are no questions, we, we can close this very, very interesting discussion mm -hmm. uh, that uh, Sarah gave us the opportunity to think about and through animals and to follow all of this uh, cross-location um, modality, um, let's say. So it's very interesting. For me, I learned a lot. Thank you, Sarah. Hey, uh, the cross-locations book should be out in a few months. Mm. Looking Just forward to it. Okay, um, right, so on behalf of uh, our laboratory, uh, thank you so much, Sarah, for being with us. Thank everyone, uh, we thank everyone who attended uh, the lecture. Uh, we continue on December 4th with the next, our next lecture uh, that will be delivered by Jans Papadakis. Uh, and um, until then, so we wish you all uh, be fine, be okay, and stay safe. There's the snow in, in Helsinki, as Sarah said. Oh. <laughs> Luckily, we don't have snow here. So. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Bye -bye.